Alright, so taking a look, where did I put this video clip? Let me just see. Uh right, can I see it here? Nope. Right, is it? When things are going wrong right. in our lives, so people I was sent a clip by Sheikh Umar Suleiman where he's speaking about jinn possession. Now, I'm using that as the, the kind of archetypal um, example, even though many people do speak about this. It's not, to be fair, it's not exclusive to Sheikh Umar Suleiman, but it's just that because he has a significant reach, it's I'm using him as a prime example to show that despite being you know, may level-headed on many things. Yet, even people like that will push and circulate and promote superstitions as part of the faith. Why do they do this? And I want to play this clip explaining it, and then I'll go, just go into it briefly. I think we have to question the reason they do this. It's much more, you know, there's so many things interlocked. You have to remember that these people are part of a, like they have a commodity that they're trying to sell. There is a market that will buy that commodity, what they are selling. Now, they must always to some extent, appease the greater market, even at times. Now, I don't know whether maybe Sheikh Umar Suleiman himself believes in this stuff. Maybe he does. And maybe he doesn't. But he will appease that market because that market is where his stuff will ultimately float and sell. And you have to remember that. So let's take a look at this clip. Uh, it's a couple of minutes long, um, and he goes. Through, he, he gives his explanations, and he gives one two anecdotes. Let's take a look. When things are going wrong in our lives, we tend to always want to blame something external. So we tend to want to say that someone did this to me, or someone must have put mm. this on me. Someone put a spell on me, so forth. But is there such thing as a jinn actually possessing a human being? A human being actually being possessed by a jinn? It does exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he affirms this in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the people who engage in usury and riba and interest, <laughs> that they would stand on the day of judgment just like the one say, who is, who enough, is possessed is to do with the day and of overtaken and being beaten on the inside and so on and so forth by the shayateen. So a person who's possessed by the jinn. By Allah saying that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again is acknowledging that there oh. are some people that can actually be possessed <laughs> by the jinn. And in a way, uh, all of us have to deal with al qarin as we said. We all have to deal with the one that's constantly whispering in us. And in a way, we're all possessed to an extent. Because the Prophet <laughs> Sallallahu says, Inna shaytana yajli min ibn adama majrad dam. That shaytan flows through the blood this hadith, of the son of attention. Adam. The way that, or flows through his veins, the way that blood flows through his veins. Meaning, you, you're always dealing with this to an extent. However, again, you, you, you're keeping it under control by keeping your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing the things so that how do you bring control about protection it? in your life and so on and so let's forth. Let's take a look. Now, it's important for us to find a middle ground here. Achha, mean, middle, as balance. Some things that, are, that cannot be explained except by these things, things that are supernatural. Supernatural. Right? And, I'm, and again, I'm not talking about the, the fake stuff. I'm talking about things that are real. Achha. Any imam of any masjid actually has had people come into his office and has seen things uh, from people that are that are definitely supernatural and definitely uh, people that are dealing with jinn. And of course, you talk to people. That Most imams Rafis, have seen this, by the way. You know, that Achha. actually try to extract jinn from people in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah and underline in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah because there's a lot of shady business that takes place there too. And they've seen a lot of things. Uh, so it's important for us to not deny everything that we've never actually mm. dealt with or seen and at the same time not to exaggerate. Right? I once had someone tell me that I think I'm possessed by a jinn. I said, why? She said, because when I read Quran, I get sleepy. I'm like, now, that's... Now listen to his actual human, explanation. Actually, right? That, that you, know, you get sleepy and you get tired as you read Quran. Right? Because if a person was truly possessed, they would actually feel pain, feel uh, pain. when they read Quran. 
So yes, yeah, sometimes jinn can possess people. And in fact, sometimes jinn can actually speak through human beings, right? Mm. And, and subhanAllah, it's a very frightening experience and, you can, and, and people have experienced that. Um, and the easiest way to get possessed, the easiest way to bring that into your way? life is to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because oh, when you oh, disobey oh. Allah, particularly when you do something Allah. major, like leave off the prayer, uh, the ulama <laughs> frequently associated a person leaving off prayer with jinn possession. Why? Because you Leaving remove prayer. the protection of Allah. That's basically most yourself. of the world. Or if you do the major <laughs> sins, and particularly Allah mentioned, for example, one of the most disgusting sins, which is riba, which is usury. Riba. And I can tell you that most I've rarely world. dealt with anyone <laughs> that had that issue, and listen except to this. that they were dealing with uh, a major sin, that they were, that they were you know, not So you praying, never dealt with a person the possessed, except they used to the commit masjid some major sin. was when a relative who does come to the masjid brought them and said, my cousin, my brother, my sister, so on and so forth, is possessed by jinn, or someone that sells haram, or so on and so forth. So that's mm. the easiest way to have that happen to you, you is do to something allow the haram. protection of Allah to re be removed from you by doing those, those things. And remember that when you do things that offend the angels, they leave you. And when the angels leave you, the shayateen come around. So if you're surrounding yourself by shayateen constantly, mm. and doing things that, that, that cause the angels to leave you, then what do you expect is going to happen to you? I don't know. Right, people. So you just had an explanation there by Sheikh Omar Suleiman about the jinn. Now, you know, before we just go into a uh, an actual the actual response to there is no such thing as jinn possession. Just to look at what he said, he said he based his thing on saying that look, we should be balanced. Okay, but you know this thing, there is no balance in this thing. By the way, this is either on or off. It doesn't work. It's like saying, look, you know, mm, you shouldn't really switch it on. You shouldn't switch it off. You should be balanced. <laughs> You're balanced. <laughs> you see, it doesn't work like that because when you say supernatural, you say, like if I say, look, guys, things... What he's saying is things should be realistic but supernatural, but they should be balanced. <laughs> it's like, w what does that mean now? Because it's either supernatural, so supernatural can be anything. Why does Now to say no, but it must be a balanced version of supernatural. The whole purpose of supernatural is it doesn't make sense. That's what you're saying. It doesn't make any sense. So to say, well, no, but it shouldn't make sense, but it should still make, uh, it should, you know, like, it doesn't, this is absolutely, it's just stupid to say that, okay, you should, but let's have a balanced, nonsensical approach. <laughs> because there is no balance to nonsensical. It's either sensical or it's nonsensical. It doesn't, to say it's either rational or irrational, but let's have some balanced irrationality. It's like, how do you balance, balance guy? You're looking for the wrong thing here. So, okay, that's one part. But okay, so he, he tries to come off quite moderate. Um, he then says, look, most imams have all experienced some supernatural phenomena. I don't know what the hell they've, I think what they've experienced, most imams, <laughs> that's some naughty, naughty that they've experienced. It's not actually supernatural. It's, <laughs> it's wrong, you know, this. So I don't know what these imams have experienced that he claims. But anyway, OK, we'll put that aside. He then highlights that, look, there's a, th this is proven from the Quran was Sunnah. OK, so he feels that it's clearly proven. He then explains one of the major reasons, because you might ask, well, if we can be possessed, how, why are we possessed? How do we get possessed? He says, well, you get possessed by disobeying God. Ah, okay. And one of the major ways is you don't pray. Ah, so that's like basically easily 95% of the globe, the entire globe. <laughs> then he says, well, another thing, one of the main reasons is, rib no, sorry, a prime example of disobeying God is riba. Riba meaning you take more than you give or something like, which is basically the entire economic structure of this globe right now is based on, on that. If you consider that haram, obviously I don't, 
not that I agree with it, but I don't consider it haram. I have a detailed video for that. You can watch it. But so in that sense, the globe, the entire globe is partaking in that. So, OK, so we're all susceptible to jinn possessions. The other thing is, you know, on a side note, I just want to say that, you know, this is the problem. This is just a side jumla mu'atarida. I'm just mentioning this as a tangent. Uh, but look, you know, when when these imams start acting too pious, this is, you know, this is what contributes to their downfall. In like, it's like some of them will say things like, oh, you know, oh, like never, uh, if, if a girl messages you, never respond, never do this, never. And then they'll get caught doing this. And it'll be a big like, oh, my God, this guy's. And you'll get like Omar Suleiman, Sheikh Omar Suleiman here saying, oh, you know, riba, oh my God, you know, money, astaghfirullah, this is the biggest sin, the most disgusting sin. Now, this is where, and you know, you'll probably find in the future that there'll be, that will, because people, you know, when they overdo it with a pious thing, that's usually their weakness. <laughs> so you wouldn't be surprised if uh, a money thing is what comes out later on. So, but anyway, that's a tangent. No, on a tangent, I'm just, just saying that. But sticking to this, this topic of gin possession. Look, people, whenever you're about to deal with something, you must ask for evidences from the Quran was Sunnah. And you must ask why. There must be objectives. Okay, so the first question is, can we be possessed? If we can, right, just asking, what is the objective of jinns possessing us? There must be an objective that they can possess us for what? So people will say to cause mischief, to cause harm. Now, they will tell you, like Ibn Taymiyyah, who's a major proponent, and all these people, even Umar Suleiman, you have to remember his background, was a Salafi background or that kind of Ikhwani, that whole, which is very, very influenced from that same kind of way of thinking. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah is one of the key problems that you'll find that he's like, you know, etiologically, you're going to find him <laughs> as a major super, he's a super spreader of this virus, um, Ibn Taymiyyah, because he really goes overboard with this whole jinn thing. And I did mention before, look, I do like some things of Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn Qayyim. But in all honesty, Ibn Taymiyyah probably had, you know, some kind of mental health issues. Now, he is a huge super spreader of this thing about jinn possession. So in his lifetime, he's this person, he says, oh, I know, he, he kind of identifies certain letters that people receive. And he says, oh, jinns wrote, write these letters and I'm a specialist on reading he claims to be a specialist on jinn's handwriting and he claim i'm not making this up you can salafis have actually published this stuff they boast about it but he he used to claim to be a specialist on identifying jinn handwriting and so he he writes about this how he can pick up which letters have come from people and which have come from jinn to mislead people and and he writes and other people they believe that jinn can take the forms of anything so they can this microphone could be a jinn, uh, a dog, a cat, a snake, a, a person. Um, this screen could be a jinn. It could be a book. It could be a table. Jinn could be anything. So now coming back to the objective, if the objective of the jinn is to create mischief, this is the objective. Then tell me something. Why? Doesn't the jinn just become a false page in the Quran? How would you know? If if that's all the jinn, like how would you know? Why doesn't the jinn just become? Because if if that's all the jinn, because think about it. When they, if if all you had to do was read a page in the Quran, but remember, there's billions of jinn. So if all of them became a false page in the Qur'an, or not all of them, but millions of them became a false page in the Qur'an, how is that so, so difficult for them? 
Secondly, let me let's take take it. You know that is actually. Let's just take an example of terrorists. You've got let's say ISIS. For all you know, let's say we Muslims generally hate ISIS. They could just be possessed. It's not really their fault. Why is it their fault? They're just possessed because a jinn. Think about it. If you were a jinn and you wanted to harm Islam, why not just become a you know, brainwash, not possess somebody, make him into a suicide bomber, and then people will hate Islam. So really, it's not that person's fault. He's possessed, isn't he? So what's the what's the big deal? Every you know, if you accept jinn possession, everything in Islam becomes redundant. This screen that you're watching now could just be a demon. How do you know? What your sheikh has taught you could just be a demon. Maybe the person who taught you the Quran was a demon. How do you know? Like, how do you know anything? Anything could just be a demon. Like I said, the whole pages in the Quran, verses in the Quran could be just demons uh, camouflaging. So it becomes ridiculous. It becomes dumb. Now they're going to say, oh no, but this is, you see that this is the thing. Like, oh no, let's balance it. What do you mean balance it? It doesn't make any sense. If you're a demon and the purpose is to cause mischief, the other thing is, why doesn't, why, you know, according to Sheikh Omar Suleiman, if they don't pray, that's basically the entire non-Muslim world. Why is it in the West, in the, in the developed world, jinn ain't just attacking everyone? You know, why, why do jinn only attack Muslims? <laughs> that too, Muslims who believe in jinn possession. It's funny that Muslims who don't believe in jinn possessions never get attacked by jinn. Only Muslims who believe in jinn possessions. You know, that's the, the dumbest thing. This, let's go to these verses that he mentioned. Now, this is a... Right, just bring in this here. So as you can see, just going to fix this. Right, you can see here, this is a verse of the Qur'an. Now, this is a verse you've got in uh, Surah Baqarah speaking about riba. Now, the actual verse has nothing to do with jinn possession. Everybody's in agreement. The actual verse is speaking about people who consume riba on the day of judgment or in the afterlife, they will be as though they have been afflicted uh, by the devil. Now that's, so people said, well, you know, like Sheikh Umar Suleiman said, well, why has Allah then mentioned this example unless it has, unless it's meaningful? So why would God say uh, as though they've been, you know, possessed, or it doesn't say possessed, but as though they've been touched by the devil, which was often a word used. Yatakhabbat means to be kind of like to be thrown around or smacked around, uh, or it could mean to, to kind of be constantly falling. Now, to be chaotic with mass, with a touch of the devil. Now, this is simply the answer is that Allah uses certain imagery that the Arabs at the time had some um, imaginative frame of reference for. And this isn't the only place in the Quran. Here is another example. You will see in uh, this verse in Safat, Allah is saying, verse 65, that speaking about the afterlife and in uh, a particular tree in in the pits of hell, that thala'uha, it emerges, as you can see here, verse 65, it emerges as though it is the heads of demons, of devils. Now, no insan have, has ever seen the heads of devils, so they don't know what this tree looks like. But why has Allah then given a frame of reference if nobody knows what the tree looks like. And the simple answer that everybody will say is that's to use your imagination. Everybody, and, and you can see that right there in that verse, Qurtubi says, 
oh, this is just for the Arabs to use their imagination. Not that anybody has actually seen what the heads of shayateen look like. Now, how do we know that jinn possession does not exist? Clearly, by the Quran. You will see, here is a verse of the Quran. Now, in Surah Ibrahim, you will see, there's, there's the verse right there. That, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ And shaytan said, لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ when the, when the affair was settled. So it's speaking about the afterlife. That when everything was settled, the shaytan says that, he says that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ Allah had promised you something and that, uh, and that turns out to be true. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ And I promised you something. فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And I betrayed you. وَمَا Now listen, to this. this is the Qur'an. Allah is saying, this is what the shaitan himself is saying. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ I had no power over you. All I did was invite you. I said, hey, why don't you do this? You responded. Do not blame me. Blame yourselves. Now, why is this important? If the devil could actually take over your body. He could make you sick. Now, they believe that the devil can make you sick. He can make you die. He can cause death. He can cause cancer. He can cause diseases. He can cause schizophrenia. He can make you not... Pro it's like Umar Suleiman said in that video, oh, if you were possessed, if you recited the Quran, you would feel physical pain stopping you from reading the Quran. So he could cause you physically to stop doing righteous actions. How do you have willpower then? How is that? The Quran addresses you as though you have willpower. It tells you, look, why didn't you do this? That's, that, that's totally unfair. If God is going to say, look, oh, why didn't you? It's like I ask you to do something. Oh, look, what? hey, why don't you come over here and eat? And the moment you start walking over here, I've got like a trap set up. So now you get caught in that trap. I, and I go, well, hey, why don't you come over here and eat? And you're thinking, well, well, that's what I'm trying to do. But <laughs> so if you're saying, well, wait a minute, God is saying pray. God is telling you recite the Quran. However, you can't recite the Quran because the devil will physically beat you up if you recite the Quran. He's Let's say he's punching you up from inside. He's punching, he's giving you liver shots. So you're feeling, as in Umar Suleiman said, physical pain. Like I'm actually suffering to read the Quran. Then how am I blamed for not reading the Quran? Let's say it was actual. Let's say it was actual. Like if I was now, let's say it was Salah time. And an actual person said to me, or he said to you, that if you pray right now, I will beat you up. In Islam, you do not right now need to pray. You can wait till later on. You don't need, like, that is a valid excuse not to pray in Islam. There is a rukhsa. If you are about to face physical harm, you can not do it. You can choose to not do it. So if a person, let's say a person had a stick and he said, well, if you pray, I'm going to beat you with this stick right now. You can not pray. You can choose in Islam. It is absolutely, in fact, that is the suitable decision to not cause harm. Don't worry, you can make up for that salah. You don't need to pray right now. You don't need to take a physical abuse to pray. Allah does not, you know, that, that you don't need to be some kind of like, Ugh. so if that's the actual case with a human, now with a jinn, if a jinn is beating me up when I'm praying, why do I have to pray? That's stupid. And why is it my fault for not praying then? This is utterly stupid. If a jinn is afflicting my ability to, to use reason, then 
how am I responsible for anything? If a jinn is making me kill someone, why do the laws apply to me? Because it could be a jinn. I could say, well, you know, a jinn made me do it. So, and they use sometimes, some of these people, they use another verse in Surah Sad of Ayyub alayhi salam when he says, مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ بِالنُّسْبٍ وَعَذَابٍ Now, I did show here that in this, several Mufassireen do highlight that look here with Ayyub alayhi salam because the Quran marad. He says that the harm is the illness he has. وَلَهُ أَسْبَابٌ طَبِيعِيَ And this is Ibn Hibban speaking. Uh, right, so he says, uh, uh, he says, وَلَهُ uh, أَسْبَابٌ طَبِيعِيَ Now this, sorry, Hayyan. Now, the illness has natural causes. Nobody's denying that. What the shaitan is doing is the waswasa. He's saying, oh, has God forsaken you? Has God made you? you know, he's making him doubt God. So this has caused suffering. Naturally, it would cause suffering. So that's what it is. Now, let's not stop there. Let's go to, this is Fakhruddin al-Razi. You can see, he clearly says, shaytan la qudrata lahu al -batta. The shaytan has no power whatsoever ala iqa'in nas fil amrad wal alam that he can make people fall ill or that he can make them suffer pain he has no power whatsoever over that and you can see that right there he has no power to cause death or to afflict uh, you know to impact life or to impact health because if that's the case he would have just been he would have just attacked prophets he would have just killed them he would have just you know, he doesn't have these powers. You are just giving him much more than he actually has. And I'll show you something interesting. All the, like Umar Suleiman said, oh, all these imams have witnessed jinns and all these things. Now check this out. This is Imam Shafi'i. Bayhaqi brings with a clear chain saying, Imam Shafi'i says, anybody who claims to have seen the jinn, we would refuse to accept that person's witness testimony. We would refuse to accept his witness testimony. Now you've got this is Ibn Hazm in his Fisal. He highlights as well. He mentions that look, Allah mentioned certain things. Whoever increases above that about jinn possessions, he has followed what he has no knowledge about. haramun la yahil. It is haram for him to do that. And he says that the only thing we know is from a sound narration and these things haven't come to us. And he does accept. Now, you see, some of these scholars, they accept that they used to think maybe epilepsy was something to do with the demon. Now, you have to understand why. Because look at, you see, look at epilepsy. Now, go back hundreds of years and imagine looking at that phenomenon and not understanding how it's because a person suddenly goes into shock sometimes they start foaming at the mouth they start shaking start smacking and people don't know what's causing because a person could be absolutely fine so in the past some people felt that it had some internal it was to do with humors the humors reached the brain they triggered this and these people felt that maybe demons assisted those, like they did something for those humors to react in that way. And that they were basing it on their science of the day. That science is utterly wrong. We know that's not what triggers uh, epilepsy. And it is the actual neural activity in the brain that is doing it. We can actually see it and measure it as it happens. So... <laughs> People of, like, obviously Ibn Hazm living almost a thousand years ago, he says that, look, these things may be to do with the humors, the Greek, the Greek humors, the four humors that you have uh, in the body. And maybe the devil has something to do with impacting those humors. But obviously, that is the science of their day and age. 
But even he clearly says that, look, anything else is khurafat. So you've had Imam Shafi'i, you've had Fakhruddin al-Razi, you've had Ibn Hazm, you've got here Imam Tahawi. Look at this, he clearly says in his Sharh Ma'ani al -Athar, that people have been asked to seek refuge from the shaitan uh, in what the shaitan has capacity over them. And that is simply wahi al-waswasa, just insinuations, telling you, in, in making certain things look appealing, that's all. And he says that as to, he mentions as to making what, uh, what he says uh, as to causing actual harm to them or ruining their stuff or causing, making their animals suffer or stuff. He says he has no, shaitan has no uh, means of doing things like that. That is utterly out of the question. And so you have to just remember something. If you accept jinn possession, nothing carries any value anymore. Because the sh any every single crime could be possessed. A murderer could just be possessed. How do you know? What makes you think possession must only be like catatonic schizophrenia? So when a person has or Tourette's, they would just say this is this is a jinn. But, well, you know, if that's the case, what good does it, if a jinn is trying to damage humanity, what good does he get by just screwing up this person, you know, just making one person have schizophrenia? How does that ruin mankind? It doesn't. How does it ruin Islam? It doesn't. So people, the, these are all mental health issues. There is nothing, the Quran is clearly against this. The shaitan is saying, look, all I can do is, all I can do is just waswasa. I can just invite you to do something. You, fala talumuni, look at this. He says, don't blame me, blame you. But if he had actual power, we can blame him. You know, if I'm, try if I'm trying to do something physical, like imagine trying to leave this building, but somebody's actually holding me. They're actually physically holding me here. I can blame them. Like if I didn't get out in time, I can blame them. I can say, you know what? This is actually your fault. So if the shaitan is physically holding me and suppressing me to do something, I can blame him. But the Quran says, the shaitan is being clear that فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame yourselves. You accepted the invite. I just said, hey, why didn't you do this? You did it. Not me. This completely ruins the message of Islam. There is zero will, irada. There is zero taklif because you don't know who's possessed, who isn't. And if you say, well, no, if a person is possessed, then it becomes apparent because they... They look almost handicapped. You think, well, why? Why does a person have to look dumb or stupid when he's possessed? Th that might be just dumb and stupid jinn. How do you know that intelligent jinn won't be more intelligent than that? And you, because you don't know, you're not getting this from the Quran anyway. You're not getting this from the Sunnah. And he quoted, by the way, he quoted, he goes on to explain uh, Mu'awwadha saying, Qul bi Rabbil Falaq and Qul bi Rabbil Nas, the Prophet used to use these. To bless himself. Now, first of all, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas clearly mentions it's just yuwaswis. It's just whispers. Fi sudurin nas. And that too, where do these whispers come from? These invites. Invite, Minal jinnati wan nas. Even people whisper. But that's all these negative things can do is just whisper. They can just invite, invite you to it. It's up to you to accept. It's not in any way forced upon you. There is la ikraha fid deen. This so goes against the Quran. It is so irresponsible to be pushing this kind of hocus pocus out there and just, you know, being a part of that just because it serves other interests. Or if you believe in it, if a person believes in it, it honestly just reflects their poor understanding of Islam. That's all it does. I've quoted to you these people. 
You know, they don't have a single, you know, for a hadith. Now, check this out. They bring, I'll tell you what they bring for a hadith. They bring the hadith that um, they, that the, uh, which uh, Umar Suleiman quoted, that the shaitan runs through the veins of the devil. This hadith is in Bukhari. Yeah. Now, read the full hadith. This is the hadith. And they won't deny it. This is the full hadith. The Prophet is walking with Safiya, his wife. She is covered up. Yeah. They walk past a group of companions who notice the Prophet with a woman as they're walking off. The Prophet comes back and he, and he greets them and he says, Hi, how are you doing? And he says to them, Oh, by the way, I was just walking. I was with Safiya. That's Safiya. So they say to the Prophet that, you know, we would never be doubting you. You know, we wouldn't say something uh, like we wouldn't say something that's inappropriate. You know, in a way, they felt embarrassed that why is the Prophet justifying it to them? This is what they felt. I'm not saying the Prophet was justifying. He was just explaining that oh, I'm with Sophia. Now, they felt that the Prophet was justifying it to them. So, you know, oh, no, no, we wouldn't accuse you or we wouldn't say anything bad about you. Oh, my God, who was that woman with you? So the Prophet says, Inna shaytana yajri min ibn Adam majratan. That the shaytan, it runs in the veins of the son of Adam. Now, what do you understand from this hadith? Do you understand that, oh, the son of Adam is possessed? That's absolutely stupid. To understand that from this hadith. This hadith is clearly speaking about when people are suspicious wrongfully of other people. That you will have negative thoughts whether you like it or not. It is human. This hadith just means it is human to have negative thoughts. Don't be too harsh on yourselves but don't act out on them. That's all the hadith means. This hadith in no shape or form means that the son of Adam is going to always be possessed by a devil. That is just stupid. And here is another hadith that is in Bukhari, which they so selectively ignore. You've got a hadith here that uh, with the Prophet, uh, that Ibn Abbas uh, says, shall I not show you a woman from Ahlul Jannah, from the people of paradise? They say, of course. He says, this woman who was a particular black lady that was there, and he mentions that she came to the Prophet and she says, Oh, I have sara, I have this epilepsy, which they claim is all a jinn, by the way. In the hadith, she tells the Prophet, I have epilepsy, I have these epileptic fits. And when I do, I end up like, obviously, I become uncovered sometimes whilst I'm in a stage, whilst I'm in a state of, uh, of a fit. So she says that pray to God for me. To cure me. And the Prophet says, if you wish, you could be patient and God will grant you an immense reward in the afterlife. And if you wish, I can pray for you. And she says, I will be patient then. And then she says, um, Right, so okay, so she says, I will be patient about the epilepsy, but just pray to God that I don't become uncovered with it, that's all. Now this hadith is in Bukhari. Now why is this hadith interesting? Well, it's interesting because if this was the devil, why is the, why is the Prophet telling her to be patient with the devil? What, that, that doesn't make any sense. Because the, the Prophet is saying, oh, why don't you be patient with the devil? As in the devil is doing this to you. Clearly not. The Prophet is saying to her, look, why do you, you know, with your condition of epilepsy, if you're patient, Allah will give you an immense reward for your patience. So that is a hadith in Bukhari, which they all ignore, by the way. And every single hadith they bring, there's only a few hadith they bring, by the way. Nothing, Sahih. The, the first one they bring, which is the only one in Bukhari, which is nothing, to, it's only to do with suspicion and negative thoughts, nothing to do with jinn possession. 
The other hadith they bring is in Ibn Majah uh, and in Al-Hakim about Uthman ibn Abil As. And that hadith is weak. It is clearly weak. It is a clearly uh, da'if hadith. You will have. I was just checking if I had it here. I'll bring it up on the screen, actually. Yep, I have got it here, actually. Let me bring that up. So this is the hadith they bring. This is in Ibn Majah, and it's in Al-Hakim. Uh, that hadith is transmitted. Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Ansari is in the chain, who Abu Dawood says became massively, he became utterly unreliable, his, his memory uh, later on. Now, he's also mentioned in Al the Kamil of Ibn Adi. There is another narration to that, which, uh, right, no, that's, the, that's that narration. It's clearly, it's unacceptable. And even Imam Nawi mentions that this Uthman ibn Abil As narration that they use, that he comes to the Prophet and he says, oh, that this is, I, I feel these things, and the Prophet kind of hits his chest and, and kind of uh, blows onto him and stuff like this. The more authentic narration which this seems to have come from is actually in Sahih Muslim, in which he's telling the Prophet that when he prays, he has difficulty remembering. And the Prophet tells him a particular dua and then pats him on the back. And he goes off saying that, you know, after that day, he felt much better with the words. He has no mention of any demons, no mention of possession. And Imam Nawawi mentions that that's actually the authentic narration to go with, not this. This is actually the weak one. Then they use another narration, which is to do with, uh, you've got Ya'la ibn Murra, uh, a particular person who says, by the way, I witnessed uh, something from the Prophet that nobody else witnessed. I had these three incidents. One of them was I was, I was traveling with the Prophet and there was some... A uh, woman with a, with a child, and eventually the child had some demon, and the prophet took it out. And he says, "And this, by the way, nobody else ever witnessed this except me." <laughs> That's enough to tell you that cha 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 shabash. Just think about it. Demons can affect afflict anyone, allegedly. Yet the prophet never teaches it to everyone. Ya'la ibn Murrah, we've never heard of, and this narration. In this chain, you've got Abdul Rahman ibn Abdul Aziz, who is problematic. You've got this narration by Manhal ibn Amr, who is considered da'if. And Ibn Hazm has said all of these are da'if. You've got Yahya ibn Sa'id ibn al-Qattan, considered him da'if. Um, so my point of saying this, people, is that there is nothing authentic uh, to prove this hocus-pocus. If you look at the Qur'an, it clearly shows you the shaitan is only capable of giving negative thoughts. It's up to you. You have willpower. That is the Quran. If you look at the sunnah, the sunnah teaches that you have willpower. Right. These one, two narrations they bring are all problematic. Ma'if. They bring that popular one about negative thoughts and they try to blag it. That is to do with jinn possession. This is a, it's probably a billion dollar industry. The amount of abuse that goes on, from physical to sexual abuse, the amount that goes on on the back of this, the, this industry, it is drenched, it is submerged in abuse. And it's supported by all of these imams who are irresponsible enough to actually certify and rubber stamp it. To say, well, actually, demons do possess people. Why don't they possess normal people? Why don't they possess non-Muslims? You don't see them jumping around having epilepsy just because, you know, what, what, why, is the, why is the first world the way it is? I mean, if all these Muslims have jinns and everything, why don't they, you know, why ain't they in that position? And yeah, they seem to know how to unlock the jinn world. <laughs> it's so stupid, the amount of nonsense that happens through all of this. I'm telling you, it's nothing but a fraud. Beware of it. Do not allow, you know, even these imams you get smiling and doing all this thing. It is nothing but BS. Okay. Demons cannot, you see, it's interesting. I'll tell you something. You know, historically, the Mu'tazila, they were, I mean, they were, by the way, people will say which scholars re re rejected this concept. I've quoted to you scholars, I've quoted to you Imam Shafi'i saying anybody who claims 
to have seen a jinn. We refuse to accept his testimony in Islam. Uh, Imam Tahawi saying that they cannot cause actual harm. Quoted Fakhruddin al-Razi. Uh, there's P- Ibn Hazm I quoted to you. There's Shawkani problematizes this. You've got Sheikh Shaltut, Sheikh uh, Jad al-Haq, Ibn Ashur. You've got so there's several or Sheikh Qaffal. Uh, you've got Baydawi. All of these scholars are Sunni scholars. They don't accept this stuff. Right, but yes, there was also a sect, the Mu'tazila. They never used to accept it. Now, what's interesting is there was never a Mu'tazili who was afflicted by a jinn. You know, who that had a jinn story then. <laughs> and it's interesting that Jahid and all these people mention this. Say that, how come the Mu'tazila don't get the jinn? Because <laughs> they don't believe in it. It's so stupid. And they just, you know, this Jahid actually mentions a, a, an interesting story. He says that there's this uh, lady who she uh, goes to this particular, there's this ex Raqi. These Raqis are all chatting, it, honestly. They are, I would say, the bulk of them are utterly fraudulent, right? Maybe some of them are sincere and just delusional. Uh, that you know they they seem to, but it is utterly a lie. Their whole industry is all about making money, right? It is on the back. It has no legitimacy to it, right? You are utterly. You are only can blame yourself for believing them because you're. So, you know, if you're that stupid to believe that demons possess people and all they do is just make them go like this, oh, catatonic schizophrenia for like years. <laughs> <laughs> the jinn's got nothing better to do, right? That is just, you, you know, you can only blame your own stupidity, right? You have to have, you know, for, for accepting that. Uh, but coming back to that story that Jahid says. So anyway, Jahid, he mentions this story that uh, this lady, yeah, so she, she, she has, she's not married. She has sex with someone. And so she's not a virgin. Now, uh, she she gets a proposal, but at that in that day and age as well, they were quite strict that the girl has to be a virgin. <laughs> so she's she's like, oh oh my god, what do I do? What do I do? So she goes to this jinn baba, who says that, uh, okay, I've got the solution for you. Uh, so he obviously takes some money from her, and then he calls her family and he says, look, she's possessed. I've done this test on her, and she's possessed. And they go, oh, oh, really? Damn, you know, we need to, please, please, please take the gin out. Please do that. <laughs> we'll pay you and we'll give all this money. So, okay, he says, well, okay, I can. But, you know, this is a powerful gin. So they go, oh, please. He says, the problem is the gin, wherever it will exit the body, it will cause some harm. So he says, I've got to make it come out of some cavity. So he says, if I bring it out the mouth, if I pull it out the mouth, it will probably break all her teeth. Uh, if you know, if I pull it through the eye, it will damage the eye. Um, he says, I could pull it out from her vagina. He says, I could bring it out from there. <laughs> ah, yeah, jinn. <laughs> you naughty, naughty. <laughs> Where does the jinn reside? He's residing. <laughs> I mean, we know that since, <laughs> you know, we know that's where men are trying to get into, but jinn as well. <laughs> so anyway, the, he says that, you know, I could, I could pull the jinn out from the vagina, but if I do that, then it means that she will, it will kind of, obviously, as it exits, it will ruin her her hymen, her virginity. So they go, yeah, that's the, yeah, let's go with that option. That's like the easiest. <laughs> so eventually Jahid writes that that's the option they chose. So he goes, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm doing the mm, hocus pocus, powering me. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, she's lost her virginity. And then basically it was happy families after that. So this is the kind of nonsense, people. And I was very disappointed to see Sheikh Omar Suleiman uh, promoting this kind of nonsense. 
But then it is what it is, isn't it? You know, where the <laughs> cha-ching, where the market is, it supports, uh, it supports that. And I tell you, these people can, I'm ask. you know what? I will accept from any of these sheikhs, if they want to dialogue, if they want to debate on it, Ajal, come on my mind trap, any of them, the sheikhs, on this topic. Challenge! This is a challenge. You know, the challenge. I offer the challenge. They cannot prove it. It is utterly against the Quran. Utterly against the Sunnah. Right? So, I remember years ago, I, I've had several debates with people on this. People thinking that they're going to uh, run rings. But there's a ring, no easy, you know? This one, not easy, you know? So, anyway, Sheikh Omar Suleiman as well. <laughs> Sheikh, Sheikh. You know what? Look, I like Omar Suleiman, but I'm being honest with you. I say this about people, and people probably thinking, you know, Mufti, why are you being a hater? <laughs> I'm not being a hater. I'm just being honest. You know, the truth is people like Sheikh Omar Suleiman are not really that educated as shiuk. They're not actually trained as scholars in Islam. They just get that title. Like they do, they probably like, you know, you have a status like khatib like a preacher status where you've done a certain amount, like you've studied Islam, let's say for about two years, you've done a few things, learned a few hadith, you can preach and give nice sermons. And yeah, that, that's the kind of status of people like Sheikh Omar Suleiman. Now, I'm not saying that to hate on him. I'm saying, look, he's done great work in human rights in America. He's kind of protested. He's kind of shown that Islam... Uh, cares about civil rights and, and I think that's amazing but in Islam he is significantly undertrained. he is not trained to be giving rulings on like fatawa he would not be trained he would not I'm not I don't mean this in a rude way but he wouldn't even be familiar with what books of fatawa are he would not even know their names he wouldn't he's not trained like this. he's not been to an Islamic institute and you'll find that with many of these imams they're not actually trained. They've just got a status. He has done some amazing things on the civil rights and social justice and stuff like that. And I commend that. But it doesn't mean because he, he stands up for, let's say, human rights or that means he's is an expert on hadith or he's an expert on the Quran. He's not at all. And so don't you have to be weary. People. I know when you look at me, you obviously see, he's saying, look at this guy. Look. <laughs> Just look at him. Just look at the way he's dressed. Look at his bloody necklace and his earring. And this guy, what could he know? But <laughs> when I pull rank, <laughs> see, the irony is out of all of these, I'm the only one who's actually trained. <laughs> Because, I mean, I mean, there are other scholars as well who are trained, but m what I'm saying is many of these people are not actually trained as scholars, and they're definitely not muftis. So, yeah, but anyway, moving on. So that was Sheikh Omar Suleiman's arguments presented were, in essence, they were a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how they actually were but so cool people i just want to uh put that out there right let's um i don't know what those questions are something about the cia i've got no idea what the hell you're writing about danny boy danny boy what is Danny Boy saying? <laughs> that was basically the arguments. Right, I think we got...